often asked, at what point am I going to stop showing up at events to do speaking on this topic? And the answer is when it becomes no longer necessary. And regardless what the size of the crowd is or how many people are watching it on Facebook and how many will see the videos later, this is an epidemic that is destroying our community. And unfortunately, the last time that I, I had the honor, I guess we'll call it, to speak in this venue, um, we were talking about the numbers of those that have died from overdoses within the Orthodox community, and that specific event was actually uh, a response to close to a, do a dozen deaths within this specific community in Queens alone. Sadly, those numbers have not gone down. Um, we're just at about 150 deaths within the Orthodox Jewish community on a national level under the age of 35, directly relating to the opioid epidemic since January 1st, 2017. When we add mental illness to that equation and we add the suicide rate, it brings that total number closer to 200. And now as I spoke last week, and I know many people hear the same thing repetitiously, and I'll just keep saying the same thing because that's all there is to say, that number is not 200 too many, it's not 100 too many, it's not 50 too many, it's one too many. And each and every one soul that we lose is one that we have to look in the mirror, look at ourselves, and ask ourselves, what could we have done? Now, I'm not saying that we have to start playing God in every case, but we have to take a responsibility. The example that I use is, if we had our kids in a school, and somebody were to say that out of a class of 25, one child in each grade would end up with asbestos poisoning, possibly get sick, or possibly die from that, I can assure each and every one of you that we would be banging down the door to the board members of that school, the principal, the philanthropists that support that school, screaming and yelling, saying, how can you let this happen? There would be a crew in the school within 24 hours, and they would start doing asbestos removal. Yet when it comes to the epidemic of drug addiction, alcohol abuse, all sorts of other addictive behaviors, at-risk behaviors, victims of sexual abuse, domestic abuse. We're not seeing that same outcry. And I don't understand why. It bothers me tremendously. And there's just no excuse for it. There's no excuse why every single high school in the world, Jewish, non-Jewish, Hasidic, Litvish, Sephardic, doesn't do random drug testing coupled with getting people help when they need it. You know, the idea of doing drug, drug testing in some schools where they've come back to me and said, well, you'd be so proud of us, we do drug testing, and we have a zero tolerance policy, and if we find out anybody's using drugs, we throw them out. So let me tell you that the bulk of the deaths that we know about were people that were thrown out of schools. Who's taking on that responsibility for throwing somebody out of a school because they have a problem? and then the result being them ending up in a worse situation and possibly dead. That's not the answer either. We need to create better educational programs, better awareness programs, and better systems in place to help our school systems, our shuls, our synagogues, our local communities, whatever it takes. This is what we need to start doing. Events such as this is the first step, and generally speaking, the most costly of all. What most of you don't realize after these events, our phones ring off the hook. The Amudim lines are bombarded with people that need help. Yet we don't see those same calls coming in to support the efforts to be able to fund the help that's needed. So we've got to look at this from a multifocal approach and saying, what could we do as a community? Whether it's getting the schools involved, the community leaders, the rabbis, organizations, philanthropists, whatever it takes. What are we going to do, both individually and collectively, to be able to bring this epidemic to an end once and for all? Are we doing enough to support those that are suffering from addiction? Do we understand that addiction is a disease? It's an illness. People that are addicts need our help, love, and support. Not only do they need our help, love, and support, but they need the love and support of their own families. All too often, we see that those that are suffering from addiction, their families want to disown them. The communities want to disown them. Even when they are sent for treatment, 
they're not getting the support of their loved ones to go through that treatment in a healthy environment. So let me tell you, I don't care what rehab somebody goes to, the most expensive, the most inexpensive state program, you know, fancy $100,000 a month. If a person going through this problem doesn't have the support of their loved ones, it is a complete waste. All too often we've had people that have come back from treatment, sober, ready to start again, and those same triggers are waiting for them back at home. And while they were out getting help, their spouse was not in treatment. The spouse was not going to Al-Anon meetings. The spouse was not getting the therapeutic or the emotional or the supportive help. And therefore, the understanding of the addiction process was not placed in an appropriate fashion. And then when the next trigger happens, the person unfortunately relapses. And I'm starting to get really frustrated with this terminology, relapse is a part of recovery. I hate that term. Recovery is a part of recovery. And that's what we have to focus on. We have to focus on the positive. Focus on people getting healthy, getting the help that they need, and being there to support them. For the employers in the neighborhood here, are we hiring people that are coming out of treatment so we can give them a reason to live? I mean, the sample that I used last week is we can get anybody sober. Keeping them sober is the trick. And if we don't give somebody a reason to live, we don't give them a reason to want to thrive, what good are we actually doing for them or for their families? Are we making sure that we're doing enough prevention? You know, let's remember, uh, most people that turned to serious addiction had something that occurred to them in their life, whether it's having a learning disability, whether it's being a victim of sexual abuse, whether it's being someone who witnessed a trauma, whether it's someone who suffered from so many other things, and the list goes on. Are we doing enough prevention and early detection to help those people before they end up down the path of addiction. You know, why are we always focusing on the Band-Aid afterwards? You know, everybody always cries, and, and I'm no stranger to publicizing, not names and not specific cases, but I'm no stranger to publicizing what the suicide and overdose rate is within our community, because I feel that's the only way that we can affect change. But what I notice is, even when we go to a local funeral, somebody that we know that passed away, at the funeral, everybody is sad. They're crying. They're in pain. They're mourning. We need to do something about it. But then the next day, they go back to their life. The family is still left picking up the pieces, suffering for years to come. But the family alone doesn't have the ability to step up and do anything to affect this change. We, the community, do. And I hate to be so blunt, we're not doing enough. We are not doing enough. Yes, within this specific community, the Chazak Organization, the Bukharian Alliance, the ABA, the other shuls in the neighborhood, the QJCC, we can all speak about events that we've done, and we keep doing them. But it's just not enough. There is still no real network here within this community to step up and say, if you have help, come to us and we'll find it. And we understand that the bulk of the reason here is stigma. And the bulk of the reason why those that have these issues or need help that don't reach out is because of the stigma. But let's remember, it wasn't all that long ago that the same stigma applied to those that were suffering from other illnesses, whether it's people that were born with you know, genetic defects. And now there are so many wonderful organizations to deal with them. Summer camps, all-year programs. A few years after that stigma broke, we were dealing with cancer, where we couldn't even say the word. And now there's many organizations that deal with cancer, both for victims, survivors, family members, insurance advocacy. And then many years ago, there was the issue with, and I hate this term, I say that all the time, teens at risk. And there was a great article written by a good friend of mine, Rabbi Yaakov Horowitz, which you know, blew the lid off that one. And so on and so forth. The time has come for us as a community to say there is no more stigma in dealing with addiction. It is an issue that we must confront. All too often, the problem that we have, and I say this and I'll say this a hundred times, the dirtiest word in the Jewish language starts with the letter S, the word Shidduch. And that is the number one reason why we can't get people help. How will it affect my community, my family, my friends? Who's going to want to marry into my family? So therefore, we're not going to get people the help that they need? 
because of a shidduch? We'd rather cry at a funeral? I mean, it wasn't that long ago. Thank God the story had a happy ending. When I had a, a middle-aged woman who turned to drugs for a reason of somewhat legitimacy, we'll call it. Someone who had a serious medical condition and required pain management and unfortunately got hooked on it. And got hooked to the point that she couldn't get off. This is a religious woman in the neighborhood married with a bunch of kids. And I remember sitting at the intervention and I remember at some point just saying, don't you realize you're going to end up dead? And her answer was, I know, but if I die, my kids will have a chance of getting a good shidduch because nobody will know why and they'll feel sad for them. But if I go to rehab, people are going to know and it's going to destroy my family. Now thank God that one case which I use in many of my speeches, she did get treatment and Baruch Hashem, she's doing great today. But that's a clear example of what we're really dealing with, what the effects are. How many times do we have an opportunity, we see someone that looks down, and we know who our neighbors and friends are. We know when our neighbor's son or daughter comes home from school and something looks a little off, to walk over and say, hey, how are you? It doesn't take someone to, you know, I, I read this line yesterday, Helping one person may not change the world, but it changes the world for that one person. And that's something that I ask each and every one of you to do. How can you change the world of one person in need by being a big brother, a big sister, by getting them the help that they need? Now let's shift for a second to when we, find, when we do target someone who needs the help. So I have to say this. The worst thing in the world today has become the internet because people think the internet is the expert in all matters pertaining to addiction, mental illness, disease, treatment. Find a licensed professional who knows about addiction and request them to help. Reach out for help. Don't be shy. Reach out, get some good ideas. For those that are involved on the community side, learn about meetings. Learn about AA, NA, SA, Gananon, Alanon. Learn about these things that save lives every single day. Let's make sure that within our community, we can look past all these issues that are really putting a major blockade. I'm embarrassed to say, or I'm happy to say, I'm not sure which one it is, that in the short lifespan of Amudim, less than four years old, we've serviced over 3,500 people who needed help between addiction, substance abuse, sexual abuse. Thank you. We're currently on the phone hours a day, approximately 240 calls a day that our staff, our dedicated amazing staff are busy with. And we're trying to keep up with it. It's just very, very difficult. Years ago, we used to try to figure out where this came from. And we tried, we thought we had answers. Unfortunately today, we don't have those answers anymore. But we know one thing, the problems are here, and sadly, the way it looks to us now, they're here to stay, and we have to change that. We have to change that at all costs possible. You know, we're gonna hear soon from a clinical expert in the field who's going to explain the physiological, the chemical response, the neurological response. But we also have to know the basic language, the difference between substance use, substance abuse, dependency, and we're going to get that. But it's really important to understand that no matter where it starts from, and unfortunately today we're seeing this major push because marijuana is getting legalized, and everybody's busy talking about, well, it's only marijuana, it's legal in so many places. So I have to tell you a couple of issues that we're seeing now. First of all, Nobody knows what the marijuana is laced with anymore today. And, and we're seeing carafentanil and so many other really, really dangerous substances that we have people that have come into emergency rooms smoking one joint, even their first joint, and because it was laced with something so deadly, giving them lifelong reactions and effects. You know, years ago there was the expression about tough love, letting people hit rock bottom, and that was the way of many people saying we're going to withhold getting somebody help until they really need it. The level of street drugs today are so deadly 
what it's being laced with, what it's being mixed with, what it's being cut with, we don't have that liberty anymore. I mean, even just today, I was reading an article about a paramedic driving to the hospital with a patient in the back that was an overdose with a Narcan reversal, which we'll do the training shortly and we'll give out Narcan kits as well. And while this paramedic was driving, he had an overdose. And his partner in the back had to put the ambulance in park and revive him. Just from touching the substance that put his patient into a state of overdose. And we also all know that, sadly, when somebody overdoses once and comes back, the chances of them dying the next time around are that much greater. But not just focusing on the drugs, I'm going to go back a step also, and it's something I like to always speak about because sometimes we forget. So let me just touch on alcohol for a moment. And I'm sure many people in this room enjoy a glass of wine or a shot of whiskey once in a while. And I'll be the first to admit, I do as well. But sadly, what we've done is we've personified alcohol in a new light. Come home from that trip from Israel, buying a bottle in duty-free, showing it off to your children, your friends, your family, putting it on top of that liquor cabinet. Now the message to the children are, this is what's important in life. So now the children want to follow what the adults do. And I say the same thing all the time about kiddish clubs. People always ask me, are kiddish clubs the reason why children are becoming addicts? And I say, I'm not sure. There's no clear data. For those that don't know, the kiddish club is when people are in shul on Shabbat morning. And usually around when the rabbi starts to speak, or when they finish reading the Torah portion and they're going to the Haftarah, a group goes out to the back to a side room, and they start drinking and having some herring and some cake. I said, I'm not sure that that's turning our youth into addicts. But what it's certainly doing is it's telling our youth that this is more important than the rabbi's speech and the Torah that we got. What message are we sending? What are we teaching the next generation? Are we encouraging them to follow this behavior? Or are we going to step up to the plate and say enough? And another very important point on alcohol, and we're seeing this now because thank God these speeches are working and more and more people are entering recovery. If you're ever at a simcha, a wedding, an event, a dinner, and you're having a shot or drinking a glass of wine, and you go to the person next to you and say, hey, join us for a l'chaim. And the person says, nah, I'm not interested. Do us all a favor and don't ask them a second time. For all you know, that person is refusing that shot because they're in recovery. And you don't want that responsibility on your shoulders if you push that person to have another drink, whether it's because of peer pressure, social pressure, social anxiety, and now that person is right back to where they started. So please be very careful with that as well. And of course, the other really important thing, and this is what I'm going to end off with now so the doctor can speak and then we'll continue afterwards, is family time. The number one thing that we're noticing is families that spend time together and children that feel comfortable speaking to their parents and knowing they can be open with them. While they may end up down these paths, but they have who to talk to. So try to be there. Try to spend time with your family. Try to do what you can to show your children that if they have a problem, they can always come to you no matter what. It's not about punishment. It's not about getting them into trouble. It's about getting them the help that they're going to need. And please, I beg all of you, encourage the schools that your children go to. Encourage the synagogues that you pray at. Encourage those that have influence, whether it's with your elected officials, community leaders, to be more open about these issues, whether it's addiction, whether it's abuse, the things that are really destroying our communities so that together as a group we can stand up and do what we can to, instead of speaking about tragedy, speak about more samachot. We need to break the stigma. But I want to touch on something just to understand, especially since many of us in this room, sadly, have community members, friends, some even have relatives that have died of an overdose, opioid-related. To understand where that comes from. And the good doctor touched on it a little bit, but we'll go a step further. How many people here have a headache and take two Tylenols to deal with their headache? Okay. 
you have a really bad headache, how many Tylenols would you take? Three. Three. Did you ever try taking one? For some reason, it's known. You have a headache, you take two Tylenols. That's where you start with. Someone that has headaches, chronic headaches, will take two Tylenols. It won't work. They'll take four. And then two days later, they'll have another real headache, and they'll start right away with the four because they know the two won't work. And this will go on. The body, the way it's designed, builds up a tolerance to substances that don't belong in there. So what happens when somebody starts abusing drugs, prescription or otherwise? Their body gets used to a certain level, a certain dosage. And then, God willing, people go and get sober, go to treatment, detox, rehab, aftercare, meetings, AA, NA. And then they have a speed bump in the road of life, which we all have. And they decide, I'm just going to go back to that last known dose that got me that desired high. However, at this point, the body had already rebuilt up the resistance it had before the person started using drugs. And now that same dose is a deadly dose. And that's why we use the terminology so often, accidental overdose, because that's really what it is. Most of these people did not want to die. They just needed to get through whatever that speed bump was. We have noticed that most of the people that we've dealt with that have overdosed were sober 90 days or greater, and many of them even a year or longer. There's also a high rate, as you just mentioned, where people were active in AA, NA, meetings, sponsor, and then, at some point, they chose not to anymore. And they lost that support structure. So we need to be as supportive as we can, and as encouraging, to those that are going through the program to get them the help that they need. We also need to remember that this is killing people at rates we have never seen before whether it was the paramedic that I spoke about that just touched a car fentanyl, or whether it's people that are experimenting. You know, in our community especially, where we are so scared to do drug education in our school systems, I could tell you I know of kids 14, 15 years old that could not differentiate between marijuana, OxyContin, other opioids, ecstasy, or any other drugs. Because when one is bad, they must all be bad. So if I'm trying one, what's wrong with trying something else? And we know people that were just smoking weed. And their dealer, which means their 10th grade friend, was away for a few days. So they got a hold of a phone number of someone else who said, hey, instead of just trying that, try something different. The lack of our education is putting our youth at a much higher risk. We need to stop that. We need to be realistic. Every time a school tells me, you know, if we introduce this topic, it's going to expose them to something. Please don't kid yourself for one second. Boys and girls both in high school know what drugs are and know about it. And if we're not going to educate them, the street will. Do we want to take that chance? Is that what we're looking to accomplish? When we teach our kids not to walk into the street without looking both ways, we tell them, because if you don't look both ways in a car, hits you, it can be very damaging, or it can actually kill you. These are all the realities of the life, but we don't want to talk about it with drugs and alcohol. We don't want to talk about it with things that we're noticing trends that have never been seen before. Who are we kidding? For one minute, don't think that this is not real. Not in my community, not in our backyard, not here, not there. They don't know. This is everywhere. Hasidish, Litvish. Modern Orthodox, Sfard, Ashkenaz, Bukhari, and Persian, Syrian. I don't care what community we are part of here tonight. And let's also all remember we're all part of one community. And these are all of our brothers and sisters that we're dealing with. So let's understand this. Alcoholism in our community needs to be looked at from a very different lens as well. Because alcohol is such a huge part of the subculture of Judaism, whether it's Kiddush every Friday night, every Simcha that we go to. So we need to be cognizant of that as well. We need to understand the role that addiction is taking in our community. We need to understand the different type of addictions as well. You know, there's gambling, internet, pornography, and I want to say this, internet 
and pornography are not the same addiction either. And by the way, you said something, I'll just go on that. We're talking about, you know, the uh, digital age that we're living in today. So studies are clearly showing that the use of technology, and I'm going to be realistic, there's no way to stop it. Our kids are going to use iPads, tablets, it's just a reality, we got to be smarter about it, limit it. But there are different serotonin that's released in the brain and some other chemical reactions uh, that, uh, back, what's the right terminology should I be using here? Neurotransmitters with serotonin, dopamine, or serotonin, dopamine that get released every time a child is using a tablet. Now, I don't think anybody here would go to their eight-year-old child and say, here, try some heroin. And I'm not saying that using a tablet is as bad as heroin, but the addictive personality component is certainly there. So we need to be realistic of all these things. Guys, leaving here tonight, and those that are watching, please understand that addiction is real. The lives that are being lost are all around us. We talk about in the times of the Churban, Ein Bayeshe, Ein Baumeis, there was no house that didn't have someone that died. That applies already in today's society. There's not a single family that I know of that doesn't know, directly or indirectly, somebody that is an addict, family member of an addict, someone that went to treatment, somebody that died. Let's hope that we can bring the need for all of these speeches to an end. And let's really thank the Chazak organization and all the other sponsors tonight for helping to bring awareness. And together we'll deal with this issue as a group and stop the death and all the other problems that we have. Thank you all so much.